Hello, America. It's Evan Grant of the Dallas Morning News here, dallasnews.com, your Texas Rangers insider. Here with this week in baseball, y'all, I'm a little bit breathless right now from having watched future Ranger wands. Oh, no, did I just say that? All right, well, we'll get to that eventually. But in the meantime, we'll talk about Juan Soto and trade rumors. But first, we'll talk about the draft after we get this little bit of housekeeping out of the way. Remember, people, I'm sorry to be pointing my gnarly finger at you as I talk to the fourth wall here. Please like these videos on YouTube. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and we will keep them coming to you because God knows America needs more of me on their computer screens. See, I took the glasses off for like effect. Anyway, let's get to the draft. Um, Rangers certainly had an interesting first two days of the draft. Uh, shocking the baseball world with Kumar Rocker at number three overall. A move that left some people scratching their heads. And then on the second day of the draft, with no second or third round pick, somehow the Rangers ended up taking right-hander Brock Porter, who was ranked by Baseball America as the single best pitching prospect in this draft at number 109. How they did that uh, still leaves me a little bit mystified, but you could make the case that the Rangers, without the benefit of a second or third round pick, got both the number one and number two pitching prospects in this draft to go with Jack Leiter, who was clearly the number one pitching prospect in the 2021 draft and if you are trying to build a championship rotation from within you're going to have to spend you're going to have to spend some capital on capital and time in growing in growing guys who are who are high draft picks they just don't come out of the woodwork woodwork not woodward as in chris no this is this is woodwork. Uh, so on Kumar Rocker, a year ago, let, let's say 16 months ago, if somebody had told you, John Q. Ranger fan or Jenny Ranger fan or however you want to identify yourself as a Ranger fan, that this team would have both Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter uh, under their control there's nobody who would have thought you were realistic. Uh, it just simply wasn't wasn't feasible. They were going to go both in the top five in, la in the 2021 draft. Um, the Rangers were trying to make their decision as to who they would take at number one. Uh, I'm sorry, at number two overall, hoping that both of them would still be left to choose from when they when they picked number two. They got lighter. Rocker had arm issues last year. Saw some velocity drop. Uh, fell to number 10 to the New York Mets. The Mets and, and Rocker agreed on a contract uh, reported to be at $6 million, but the physical exam showed some concerns over the shoulder and the arm. The Mets would not sign off on the agreement, reduce their offer greatly. Rocker said, see you later. Passed on their offer, went back into the draft, was done with school, um, had surgery that was described by uh, his agent, Scott Boris, as minor non-baseball related arm uh, procedure. Uh, we've gotten no further explanation of that. And then this spring, he, he pitched five times in an independent league, uh, certainly showing great stuff, showing 94 to 98 mile an hour stuff, uh, but he only pitched 30 innings in that league. Um, and re-entered the draft. There was some question about where he would go. He was still viewed as a first-round talent, but there was risk, um, and the risk was all medical related. But when you were looking at all the Rangers' possibilities at number three, there was risk uh, associated with all of them. There's no such thing as a safe pick in the draft. Really, there isn't. Maybe, maybe once in a decade, the number one is a can't-miss prospect. But other than that, there, there's risk associated with every pick. 
uh, Elijah Green, who I thought would end up being the Rangers' number one pick. Um, there are questions about his propensity to swing and miss. Tamar Johnson, who the Rangers passed on and who went immediately after him, uh, after Rocker, went number four to Pittsburgh, uh, was considered the best high school hitter in the draft, maybe the best high school hitter in two decades uh, since Joe Maurer. But there's questions about whether or not he's physically maxed out and how much ceiling he's got still to grow from high school to, be, to, to through the minor leagues. Um, Kevin Parada, the catcher from Georgia Tech, uh, hit 26 home runs this year, but if you watch video of, of him that's available online, you see, a, 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 to me, a, a really challenging batting stance in which he, he, he gets ready for the pitch or before the pitch is delivered, almost with a, a peekaboo type stance where he's kind of looking cockeyed through his uh, front shoulder. Uh, and then he gets into an athletic position, but I'm not sure that you'll be able to do that at, at the big league level with regularity. So there's risk associated with all those guys. Um, and the Rangers, the Rangers perspective was they had no risk about the rocker's ability to reach his potential. If he's healthy, they got medical reports from Neil Elitrosh, the doctor, the Dodgers team physician, one of the best orthopedists in the world, um, sports orthopedists in the world and got very good, favorable medical reports. They'll still have to pass Rocker on a physical um, once they, they get him in here. Uh, but it appears the sides have, have all but reached an agreement, uh, according to three people that, that have spoken to the Dallas Morning News who have knowledge of the negotiations. There's a, a, a framework for an agreement in place at $5.2 million, which saved the Rangers about $2.5 million, a little bit less than that, in cap space that they could then go and spend on another pick. Well, that pick turned out to be Brock Porter, uh, who was considered the number 12 pick overall in the draft by Baseball America, but didn't go in the top 12 picks and then started falling out of fears over signability. He was certainly seeking a, a bonus in the range, I, I believe, of $4 million. And his team's number one picks, that slot values fell below that. Uh, there became some question about signability. Now, I've got a stupid theory here, and that theory is that when the Rangers saw that uh, Baltimore, which had a number of, of, of high draft picks and had a, a large pool to play with and could have manipulated money, when Baltimore took Jackson Holiday, who was clearly going to take a full slot bonus to sign, and Arizona at number two, who had a similar number of high draft picks and a big bonus pool, took Drew Jones at number two, the Rangers said, we could take Rocker and hope that somebody like Porter, probably in specifics, that Porter, based on things that we're hearing, would become available. And that's what's happened. And, and, and it, it appears these sides have, have, uh, have talked. Um, and I think there is a framework there for a, a, a bonus in the range of $4 million. And so effectively, the Rangers without a second or third round pick got potentially the first and second best pitchers in this draft. It's a, it could be a real coup. The cautionary tale that I will mention for you is this. In 2015, Rangers had the fourth overall pick. They went with college pitcher Dylan Tate at number one, fourth overall, signed him for a, a bonus Below slot, probably the player that they had most targeted was Alex Bregman, but he went to Houston ahead of them. So the Rangers, the Rangers went with Tate, and then they signed him to a deal that that saved them eight hundred thousand dollars in cap space. They then used that on their second round pick, Eric Jenkins, an outfielder from North Carolina, and most importantly, Michael Machuela, a right-handed pitcher from Duke, who had been considered the best college pitcher going into his junior season before elbow surgery the rangers gave both those guys two million dollars well above their slots at that point uh and and bet on their upside well jenkins was an absolute bust never hit he had great speed but never hit machuela could never stay healthy the the, the first tommy john was just a precursor of more and more injuries and so what the rangers ended up with was 
Dylan Tate, who they didn't really care for and, and dealt for a rental and nothing from the second and third from the second and third rounds. So you can, you can have all this stuff fall into your lap or you can be willing to spend this money and a, you can end up with a lot of egg on your face. On the other hand, all you got to do is be right one time on this. And if, if you do, you, you put together the nucleus for a championship rotation. And so that's where the Rangers are um, through their first two days of, of drafts. And really the first 10 rounds are, uh, are, are the most significant in the draft. The, 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 the final day of the draft uh, bonuses are maxed out at, at $125,000, I believe it is this year, unless you've got extra cap space to spend. And with Rocker, and Porter, and then the two picks that they took behind them, uh, outfielders Chandler Pollard, a high school uh, outfielder from the same school that produced the liner to Shields, Woodward Academy, and that I did say Woodward and not Woodwork, uh, in Atlanta, and Tommy Speck, an outfielder from Waller Catholic High School in Dubuque, Iowa, the same school that produced last year's fourth rounder, Ian Mahler. Uh, those guys are probably going to require maximum bonus, perhaps a little bit more. There's some things that teams can do where they would pay an overage tax for exceeding their cap pool up to 5%. That overage tax is tax at 75 cents on the dollar. So you could essentially, if you're the Rangers, have about $475,000 extra to spend if you're willing to actually spend about $825,000. If you go over 5% above your cap, you're gonna start losing draft picks. They will not do that. The other part that is important here is it's also imperative for the Rangers to basically sign these high level guys because if they don't sign them, they're going to lose that cap space and it makes it all that much more difficult to, to get these other guys in under, under what would be a reduced cap. Got all that? That's the simple part, because now we get to Juan Soto, and let me just say this. The All-Star Game will be taking place. Baseball on its centerpiece, center stage. No other sporting event in the world right now. It's all baseball. Get to Los Angeles, and what's the word? The word is that the Nationals have offered Juan Soto a $440 million contract, the outfielder. 23 years old, certainly a franchise caliber player, franchise changing player. Uh, he's eligible for free agency uh, after, I believe it is 2024. So two plus years. He turned down the 15 million, the 15 year deal that would have paid him right at 30, uh, just about $30 million a year. Um, and he's betting on himself. And what was leaked was that the Nationals will now entertain uh, trade proposals for him and listen I, you watch the rangers this weekend this past weekend against seattle julio rodriguez has the, the ability to be a franchise changing player a generational player um but i'm going to use that that term loosely generational player because the astros have a generational hitter in jordan alvarez the angels have a generational hitter and player in mike trout they have two of them in Trout and Otani. So there's a lot of those guys around the American League West. And you could make a case that if the Rangers want to contend, they're going to have to add that kind of player. Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon are great players. Um, are they that caliber of all around defensive power hitting speed guys that, that this group is? I don't know. I do feel like a Juan Soto, you add that to the mix, and all of a sudden you're talking about a lineup that is really difficult to pitch to. Um, Soto's really disciplined at the plate. He's got a great, great knowledge of the strike zone. Uh, he's on base even when he's not hitting. And so what do you do if you're the Rangers? Are you at a point right now where you say we will mortgage the future or mortgage a, a significant part of the future to try and get in this Juan Soto Derby? 
Uh, the Yankees, you would expect, would be in it. The Mets, you would expect, would be in it. The Rangers, with what is considered a top 10 farm system right now, certainly have the capital to at least be part of that conversation. Question is, are the Rangers willing to give up, give up something, a package that would start with, start with either Jack Leiter or Josh Young, and include some other high-level players. I would think that the Nationals right now would also have their eye on a guy like Leody Tavares, who, who has the ability to be a sensational player and has done a great job of changing himself since he's come back to the majors. So you would be talking about peeling off the, the top layer of the system without yet having – establish that you've got championship caliber pitching uh and and potentially you know handicapping yourselves before you ever get to contention again um so it's a real it, it's a real question for the rangers to, to entertain and, and and listen i think the one thing they have to do is go through the exercise you have to go through the exercise of okay what are we willing to give up what would it look like to have soda um, let's be realistic that if you acquire Soto, you're only acquiring for him for the two plus years. Uh, I, I see no way short of, of offering over a half a billion dollars to an individual player. And remember, they've already got half a billion dollars tied up in two other players. Uh, short of doing that, you're not going to have a chance to keep Soto past free agency. So are you content that you can acquire him now and that you'll still have the wherewithal in your system to restock this organization when Soto leaves in free agency? Uh, I'm not sure that, that I can, I'm not sure that I can say that. I'm not sure that, that the Rangers can, can make a, a viable case for that. I, I, I think that you've got to get to contention You've got to prove that you can win first before you can start adding some of these pieces and mortgaging your future. It's one thing to go out and add these guys in free agency. It's another thing to give up the kind of capital that you'd have to give up in terms of, of, of talent in a system to acquire a player like this. So the trade deadline is August 2nd. I'm not sure that anybody will be able to come up with a, with a package commensurate to acquire the home run derby champion Juan Soto. Uh, who's to say that this wouldn't go into the off season? Um, but if if I'm the Rangers, I'm certainly investigating it. And and where I was going with my train of thought on this before I I got aimlessly lost is simply this: I think the exercise that they went through in the draft of okay, this is what things could look like if we draft Kumar Rocker and how we allocate this money and see all that play out where they end up with Brock Porter as their second pick. You have to go through those kinds of exercises, whether it's the draft or the trade or, or, or the trade market to kind of play them out and see if you can hit upon uh, a scenario that, that makes sense for you both short and long-term. Um, and I think that is, that's a key here. The Rangers, though it's been five plus years since this team has had a winning season and while Chris Young is, is, is very anxious to make an impact as a winning GM, this team still has a long way to go. And his model is built on sustainability. It's not built on, on just getting back to the playoffs. It's built on getting to the playoffs, having a dominant run over the division, much the way the Houston Astros have for the last seven years, and um, having year in and year out contention for, for, for the World Series. The Rangers have all the drivers in place to do that in terms of revenue. They have a great minor league system that, that really looks like it is starting to produce. Leody Tavares and Josh Smith uh, have been huge uh, producers this year, um, kind of producers you haven't seen from Rangers rookies in, in a while, to be perfectly honest. So there are things moving in the right direction. I'm just not sure that I could say that the jump – into the Soto end of the pool um, wouldn't result with the Rangers hitting their head on the, on the side. So um, I think you investigate. I think you deliberate. But I think ultimately the price 
would potentially would potentially hinder this team's opportunity to really um, have the sustainable model that they would like to have. It's a lot of words to basically say, you look at it, but it's probably not going to happen. But see, the thing is, I kept you here the whole time. Probably not. You're probably gone. But I'm going to be gone too. Uh, we'll come back with another video next week in Rangers baseball, y'all. Until then, so long, everybody. Bye.